Good morning, everyone. How are we doing? <coughs> Two people are good and a cough. I mean, that was, I'm overwhelmed by the anticipation and the excitement that's in the room uh, this morning. It is Mother's Day, as we've mentioned, and we do want to take an opportunity, <coughs> let me join the coffin, uh, to thank all the mums and people in mum-type roles who serve uh, in our community and in this church and um, just around, you know, things wouldn't function um, without you. Uh, and that's why we do want to take the opportunity to just say thank you um, and hopefully bless you a little bit this morning. Um, and we'll, Rachel will explain a little bit more about some of the stuff we've got going on after the service. That hopefully will just be a little blessing um, to you. But as I, you know, on Mother's Day, I often reflect about, like in our family, I know we're all different and, and our approaches to parenting and all of those things um, is a little bit different. But, and that's very true in, in my family because um, Louise and I both have, uh, we'll both have kids. Uh, we're married and we, yeah, anyway, that's weird. So we're, our kids, there you go, that's what I'm trying to say, um, are a bit older. So Leah, my daughter's 19, she's off at Cardiff um, Uni, and Malachi's 14, he's serving upstairs in kids um, at the moment. So our kids are sort of um, growing up or, or growing up. But our approach to parenting, Louise and I, it, is very, very different. Um, and often because, well, Louise works harder than I do. She's serving in Fireflies at the moment, or FPC Tots, so I can say this, and that's fine. And she, yeah, anyway, so she, she works harder than I do. I remember when Malachi was little, um, he once said, dads are for cuddles and mums are for wiping bottoms. And I was like, yes, you know, this is good. I've worked hard. Um, and, you know, in the night when our kids would call out, um, sometimes I'd go to them, that's if I couldn't sort of subtly kick Louise to wake her up so she thinks I'm still asleep and she's awake, and then she'd naturally go. But, you know, I was sort of trying to wake her up. But sometimes that didn't work, so I'd go um, into the kids, uh, and they would tell me whatever it is that's bothering them and that they've called um, for me. And my standard response would be something along the lines of, well, there's not much I can do about that. Uh, and then I go back to bed. And eventually, you know, it didn't take long for them to realize, well, if we call for mum, uh, we get a better response. Uh, you know, again, job done. I remember once Louise, uh, when Leah was really, really little, um, Louise called out, um, uh, Leah called out in the night, and Louise went to her um, and picked up a book. Um, and sat, we used to have like a chair next to her. She was in a cot at this, this time. Um, and she read this story um, to, to Leah and then came back to bed. She did the entire thing asleep. The book was upside down and she recited the story from memory in her sleep. I mean, that's extreme, extreme parenting, uh, you know. And then there's those moments where there's not enough cake to go around. You know, that's an awful moment in, in a family's life, isn't it? There's not enough cake. Louise's natural response is often to go without and let everybody else um, have a slice of cake. That is never my natural response um, at all. So we approach parenting very differently, and I'm thankful, and my kids are so thankful for Louise and all that she, um, she does. And, that, and we're thankful for all of you who, who serve in that way in your families and in your communities. And actually, there is something sacrificial and selfless in the way that so many mums serve their families that actually reminds me and points me back to the sacrificial, the selfless love that God has for us and that God has demonstrated um, for us. And we're going to sort of pick that up um, a little bit this morning as we carry on through this series. We're sort of coming towards the end of this series called Countdown, and we've been following Jesus' journey to the cross. You can catch up um, on our YouTube channel or FBC Next. We've also got a new podcast as well, so you can listen um, to some of the, the messages back, um, just the audio version um, as well. And what we've been doing over this series is just looking at some of the events that surround um, Jesus' um, well, journey to the cross. And, and we've discovered that the crucifixion of Jesus wasn't a mistake. It wasn't the things that had gone wrong. It was actually part of the plan all along. And actually, there's a bunch of stuff that Jesus did that engineered this, that, that made it possible, or that, that sort of caused these things to happen. So we've been exploring some of those things and, and looking a bit closer at uh, what Jesus was doing or what's going on um, in his life uh, at that time as he sort of approaches um, the cross. And we're going to carry that on um, and explore an intimate encounter that Jesus had with his closest friend, uh, with, his, with his disciples. Um, so John's sort of captured all these, uh, these events for us, and we're going to pick it up at uh, the start of chapter 13. And it says this, 
It was just before the Passover festival, and Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And so John is sort of setting the scene for, for when this is. It was just before the Passover festival. Like This is the day before Jesus would be executed. So in just over 12 hours' time, Jesus would be nailed to a cross. And this is sort of like his last evening with his, um, his disciples, those people that he's journeyed with for the last um, three years. They're his closest friends. How is he going to spend this time? What's he going to do um, with them? Well, let's, let's read on. The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of um, Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Now, I mean, my word, we could spend ages unpacking uh, what, what's in that. You know, the, the devil had already prompted Judas to betray Jesus. And you know what? There's, there's loads of um, stuff that you could read about, well, what does this mean? Like, who is the devil? Uh, what does it mean that it's already prompted um, Judas and all of those sort of things? And you could spend ages debating that and dissecting that um, and, you know, theorizing or theologizing about that. And if I'm honest, where you'd get to at the end isn't much further than where you are at the moment. You know, th- there's a load of stuff about, well, who is the devil and what does the devil do and what's it about? Um, and actually, the Bible isn't always that clear or doesn't always tell us a lot about this sort of stuff and going on there. And I think that must be a reason uh, for that. And I think actually, well, maybe it's because God doesn't want us to focus on who the devil is or what the devil is. He wants us to focus on other things and focus on him. And, you know, what I do know from from this is that this isn't an excuse um, for Judas. It's not a case of, well, the devil made made me do it. The point is, at this point in time, Judas had already made up his mind. And perhaps his will is in line with with the devil's will uh, for what's going on here. But Judas had already made up his mind that he was going to betray Jesus. And again, we could spend ages talking about, well, why did he do that? And what, what made him feel that he needed to do that? The point is, he did it. The point is that that's already happened. And Jesus knew that Judas had done this. Now, put yourself in that situation. You know, this is your last night on earth before you're going to be executed and and crucified. And one of your closest friends is in the room with you. And you know that they've betrayed you, that they're going to hand you over to the people who are going to arrest you and beat you and crucify you. How would you respond? How would you treat that person? Well, probably very differently to how Jesus does. Let's, Let's read on. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he'd come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal and took off his outer clothing and wrapped a towel around his waist. And after that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. I mean, this is an amazing couple of verses. Jesus knew who he was. Jesus had ultimate power. He had ultimate status. A bit later on, he says to his disciples, all things in heaven and on earth have been given to me. Jesus knew exactly who he was. He knew that the Father had put all things under his power. You know, Jesus is it. There isn't anybody who is more powerful. There isn't anybody who is more important than Jesus. So what does he do with that status? What does he do with that power? Well, he gets up from the table and he takes his outer garment off and he wraps a towel around him and then he goes up to his disciples and he kneels down at their feet and he begins to wash their feet. You see, in our culture and our society, the more powerful we become, the more important we become, the less menial stuff we do. You know, it's a sign of success when you have people to do this sort of stuff or to do these menial tasks for you. There's nobody who is more important or more powerful than Jesus. He could have commanded his disciples to get up and wash his feet, and they would have happily done it. But he doesn't. 
he gets up and he kneels down before them and he washes their feet. And I'm sure you can imagine this was not a pleasant thing to do. So we're going to copy this now. We've got some buckets of water. No, we haven't. You know, but you would like to do that. And we live in a nice, clean society. We have sanitation. We have closed-toe shoes. They didn't have that. They had open-toe sandals, and they lived in a very dusty climate. Their feet would have stunk. This is not a nice thing to do. Yet Jesus is willing um, to do it. Just imagine the scene. Imagine what the disciples were thinking as Jesus comes comes up um, to do that and serve them in this way. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? And Jesus replied, you do not realize now what I'm doing, but later you'll understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Now, why does Peter respond in this way? See, it's not uncommon to have your feet washed in this culture, in this society. In our culture, it's a little bit weird and it's a little bit odd. It's not a thing that you do um, often. But, but in this culture, it is a thing that happens often, especially if you're, you're rich. You would have servants who would wash your feet or the feet um, of your guests. At least when you walked into a house, there'd be a bowl of water that you would wash your own feet um, with because of just, again, the climate and the dust and the, um, and the dirt. So this is an uncommon thing, but there's something going on in Peter that makes this uncomfortable for him. He would have had his feet washed before, but why doesn't he want his feet to be washed now? Well, obviously, it's partly because of who Jesus is, and he recognizes, well, no, you're my Lord. You're my master. You are the Son of God. You are the Messiah. You're God himself. No way are you going to wash my feet. He recognizes the gulf between him and Jesus, and he thinks, this isn't right. You shouldn't be, you shouldn't be doing this. But I think it also points to something else, and that is this, this thing that it, it can actually be quite difficult for us to allow people to serve us. It can be quite humbling. It can be quite vulnerable to put yourself in a place where you allow somebody else to help you. Maybe that's more true of our culture than it was at the time of, of, of Peter's culture. But, but in our world, we, we live in a culture that sort of demands that we have it all together, that, that we're all sorted, that we don't need help um, from anybody else. And again, if you're, if you're successful, you, you don't need to rely on anybody else. You don't need anything else from anyone in order to get stuff um, done, which is a complete load of rubbish. Of course we need one another. Of course uh, we need help. But that doesn't make it any easier to put ourselves in a situation or a position where we allow people to metaphorically wash our feet, to al that we allow people to serve us and help us, that we're willing to be humble enough and vulnerable enough to say, I haven't got all this together. I need some help in this area. Will, will you help me? And I think that's something of what's going on here for Peter, that he's thinking, well, no, you're, you're my Messiah. You can't be doing this. But also, it was quite exposing to him that, um, that he needed his Messiah to wash his feet. Let's read on. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then Lord, Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Unless I wash you, Jesus said, you have no part with me. And I think, you know, Jesus is talking more uh, about something more than just washing feet um, here. Jesus isn't saying, you can't be with me if you have stinky feet. Um, he's, he's pointing to what's going to happen tomorrow and this ultimate sacrificial act that will cleanse him <clears throat> and will wash him and will make him clean. You know, Jesus is saying, you can't be be with me if your feet are dirty. He's saying, it's not possible for you to be with me unless you allow me to cleanse you. Not your feet, but to cleanse you of your sin and the the dirt that just clings to you, the, the dirt that comes from all those things that you've said and that you've done and that you thought that you knew you shouldn't say, you knew you shouldn't think it, you knew you shouldn't do it, but you did it anyway. The dirt that clings to you from all the stuff that other people have said or, or, or done to, to you. Jesus is saying, you know, unless I cleanse you, unless you allow me to make you clean, 
you can't have a part uh, with me. So this is more than just about um, washing feet um, here. And I think actually that what is going on here, so you know, Jesus is obviously pointing forward to what he's about to do on the cross for them. But I think this is also linked um, to this thing called baptism, uh, which we do. We've got a baptistry back here, which is a symbolic act. You know, this is a symbolic act that Jesus is doing for his disciples. He's symbolically washing their feet to symbolize that, that cleansing um, of their, their sin. And, you know, we don't always do well with, with symbolism because we think, well, it's just a symbol. Um, and, you know, so therefore, do I really need to focus um, on the symbol? And Jesus says, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. And I, so I do think this is, this is linked um, to baptism, which is a symbolic act of allowing ourselves to be cleansed by Jesus. When we get baptized and we go in, into water and we, we baptize people by full submersion, that's what the word baptism means. It means to dunk or, or to dip or to plunge. So we literally dunk, we dip, we plunge people um, into water um, as a symbolic act of the cleansing that, that comes from Jesus. Now that water doesn't make us any cleaner than we were before, or at least I hope it doesn't, because I'm in the water often with other people uh, in, in that case. You know, it's a symbolic act that points to what Jesus has has done for us, that Jesus has cleansed us um, of our si sin. Um, it's symbolic, but it's still important. And, you know, you can, we can, this thing, conversation is a bit strange because Jesus is pointing to something else, but he's also pointing to the physical reality. You know, Jesus, I don't think Jesus is saying this is about smelly feet. He is saying this is about you allowing me to cleanse you, but he is talking about in this moment, you have to let me wash your feet now. So if this is linked to baptism, let me ask those of you who are followers of Jesus, who haven't actually taken that step to get baptized, why not? You know, you don't have to answer that to me, but you do have to answer that to yourself. That, that baptism, just like washing feet in this, this instance, is something that Jesus expects us to do. He sort of commands us, believe and be baptized, that when we recognize that Jesus is the Son of God, that he is the Messiah, when we try and orientate our life towards him to follow him, his expectation is that we will follow that up with a symbolic act of baptism to publicly declare our faith in who Jesus is and to mark that we have been cleansed of all that gunk and all that junk and all that dirt that clings to us, that we've been cleansed of our sin. So if you've not done that, at least ask yourself, why not? You know, I, I, it took me a while to get baptized. I became a Christian um, way before I got baptized. And the big reason I didn't um, get baptized was, one, because, well, it's symbolic, and symbolism isn't important, I thought. But two, was because people told me I should get baptized. And you're not telling me what to do. You know, I, I'm big enough. Um, I can make my own decisions. So I sort of pushed back against that thing of people telling me what I should do something. I thought, well, I'm not, not going to do that. And eventually, I realized that I shouldn't allow my my stubbornness to get in the way of being obedient to Jesus and an opportunity for God to meet me and bless me. So I'll leave that with you. But, you know, Jesus says to Peter, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. And Peter's response, let's just highlight that. Um, the, then Lord um, Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head <clears throat> as well. And I love this response. You know, Peter is all in. He, he's struggling with this because he's like, well, surely you're not going to do this uh, for me. And Jesus says, no, I have to. this has to be the way. And Peter's like, okay, well, don't just do my feet. Do the whole lot as well because I'm completely and I'm utterly sold out for you. I am devoted um, to you. I want to be cleansed by you. Or if I have to be cleansed by you, I want to be cleansed by you completely. But Peter sort of misses the point a little bit and Jesus answers those who've had a bath need only to wash their feet their whole body is clean and you are clean though not every one of you for he knew who was going to betray him and that's why he said not everyone was clean and again this is all we're lost in this and um, well, we're stuck in this sort of physical and symbolic act that that you know is Jesus talking um, symbolically here about those who've had a bath need only to wash their feet or is he talking well no you have had a bath and I'm not going to wash you completely because I've got you know 11 other people to get around and we'll be here forever you know there's this sort of strange sort of dialogue um, going on here but the point that Jesus is, is making um, is you know 
you're clean. You're clean because of what I've done um, for you. And of course, there's a lot more going on here than, than we can first understand. That's always the case when Jesus does stuff. You know, if we just look at face value, we miss so much of, of what else is going on behind the scenes. Jesus never operates in a one dimension uh, point of view. There's so many things that he's referencing and, and talking about and, and, and pointing to here. Um, but he's saying, you know, you're clean. Because of what I've done for you, because of this act of washing your feet, more importantly, because of what I'm about to do for you, because of what I've said to you, because of how I've served you, you are clean. But not all of you are clean. And we know that who Jesus is thinking about. He's thinking about Judas, because he knows what Jesus, Judas has done, uh, and he knows what Judas is about um, to do. So, so why is Judas not clean, but Peter is clean? You know, is Judas not clean because what Jesus has done isn't enough for him? Is this act of washing feet? Because Jesus got down at Judas's feet as well and washed his feet as well. How awkward must have that been? You know, Judas knew what he's about to do. He's known what he's already done. He's known how he's already set the wheels in motion for the events to involve later that day. He knows that. And Jesus is there washing his feet. And Jesus, as he's there washing Judas's feet, knows that. He knows what Judas has done. He knows what's about to happen. He knows that he's going to be betrayed by him. Yet he still does it. Was that not enough for Judas? Was, did Jesus not do enough to make Judas clean? Well, no, of course he did. He, he, everything he's done through this symbolic act and through the cross it, is enough for Judas to, make, to be clean but he wouldn't, Judas didn't put himself in a position that would allow himself to be clean. You see, Simon, and so Peter, and Judas, you know, they, they, they're similar. They both make mistakes. You know, later on, when Jesus does get betrayed by Judas, Simon gets a sword, and he chops off the ear of one of the soldiers. And then Jesus has to say, no, come on, you're missing it at the point. And he puts his hand on the soldier's ear, and, and he restores um, the ear. And a bit later on, you know, so Jesus, Jesus is taken away and all the disciples flee and um, Simon Peter follows on at a distance um, and people come up to him and say, you're one of the followers of Jesus and, and he denies knowing him. He abandons Jesus in his hour of need. He makes mistakes, but, but why is it that Peter is clean and Judas is not clean? Well, it's simple. The, the reason is because Peter was willing to put himself in a position to allow Jesus to cleanse him. He was willing to acknowledge his mistakes, to own up to his mistakes, um, to own them, to not blame somebody else, not to point to somebody else, to say, no, that was me, I did that, and I'm sorry, and I need you. And by putting himself in that position actually made it possible for him to be made clean. See, Jesus has done everything that he needs to do to make us clean. But it still requires something from us. It still requires a response from us to actually say, well, are we willing to accept that? Are we willing to receive that? Are we willing to allow Jesus to wash our feet and to make us clean? Let's read on. We're almost at the end. And when he'd finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and he returned to his place. And he says, do you understand what I've done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. But now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash um, one another's feet. I've set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. And very truly I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. And you know, Jesus is adding in another dimension here. He says, look, I've done this for you, and I want you to do the same for one, one another. I've set you an example to follow. And he's not talking about washing feet. He's talking about serving one another. You know, I've done this for you. My life has been orientated um, to, towards you. You know, in this act, Jesus literally takes on the nature of a servant. And he says, look, I'm your Lord, and I'm your master. I'm your king. I am your God, and I'm willing to serve you. 
so too should you serve one another. And, and if you're a Jesus follower, if you've signed up to follow Jesus, this is what it involves. This is what, this is what it's about, is actually following his example and being willing to serve other people. You know, in a couple of weeks' time, um, we've got the opportunity to do that on the top three slide. You'll find out some information about the Community Litter Pit, which is something that we do every year with our community, where we go and serve our community. And it's... Um, in one way, it's not the most pleasant job walking around with a, I mean, I think it's quite fun, but we know with a little picker and picking up rubbish and sticking it um, in a bin, because um, you walk around and there's people who are not doing that. And you know, I often think to myself, well, what must I look like? Do they think I'm on community service um, or something uh, like that? Do I look a little bit silly that I'm doing this? And it's not my rubbish, you know, I've not put all this stuff here. Um, why am I doing that? Well, the reason we do that is because Jesus washed our feet. The reason we do that is because Jesus has served us and loved us and set an example for us to do, um, to do the same. And the reason we do that is because we want to be for our community and we want to practically and actively and sacrificially serve our community. Why? Well, because Jesus has done that for us. He's practically, he's actively, and he's sacrificially served us. So we take a, a week out of our normal um, routine to find a practical way to demonstrate this love of God. And do you know what? It's more about what it does for us than often it is for what it does for the community because it puts us in a place of humility where we're willing to serve one another and follow in Jesus' footsteps. But sadly, there'll be a bunch of us who are Jesus followers who won't come. Um, and the reason they won't come is because it's beneath them. Um, because, well, why should I pick up? I don't even live in the area, so why should I um, pick up left litter in Finch? Um, so yeah, actually, um, we had a bunch of people last year who didn't come to Finch, but went around wherever it is that they lived and just picked up litter in their streets on that Sunday. How amazing is it? Is that I love our church for that. But, but I want to poke you a little bit. Um, if that is you, in terms of if you have that mindset, yeah, I believe in Jesus and I follow Jesus, but I'm not picking up litter um, because that's beneath me. Hopefully there's a bell ringing in your head right now because that's not what Jesus has set and that's not the example that Jesus has set. It's a little bit heavy and I know I've guilt tripped you all into being here in a couple of weeks' time, uh, but I, that's not what I'm trying to do here at all. I'm just trying to poke and provoke us into thinking, well, what does it mean for me to actually follow um, Jesus in, in this way? And we've got a great opportunity to do that. But it's not about picking up litter. It's not about washing feet. It's about orientating ourselves. It's about having a posture of a willingness to serve the people around us and the people we come into contact uh, with. And we do that because Jesus has done that for us. But we also do it because we're blessed when we do that. Actually, something happens. Something is unlocked in us when we're willing to serve one another. And our lives are better. Yet maybe not in a worldly sense. We're sure we're not richer um, or more powerful or those sort of things. But we are blessed in ways that we will never understand if we don't do that. So Jesus has done this amazing thing the day before he's about to be crucified. How, how awesome is that? And that, that is so challenging and so inspirational for what it means to be a Jesus follower. Let me give you two really quick things to think about. So where can you practically, actively, and sacrificially serve people this week? What situations come to mind? You know, at home, at work, at church, in, in your, your neighborhood? Um, again, uh, you know, I think in a, a home, I, I approach this very differently to Louise. I, I do serve at home. I do pull my way. Um, but I do it in a different way to, Lu, to Louise. So, you know, so perhaps I've emptied the dishwasher or I've um, done the washing or I've hoovered the lounge or, or I even I've done all three of those things because I'm an amazing, helpful guy. Um, when Louise gets in, I say to her, oh, I've emptied the dishwasher and I've hoovered the lounge and, and I've put the washing out. I think it's a guy thing. It, do other you know guys do this? Like, we, we list off the things that we've done um, expecting, oh, thank you, well, well done. You know, like I should be rewarded for that. It's, 
I mean, it's part of being a dad, it's part of um, living in the house. Louise doesn't do that. She doesn't list off all the things um, that, that she does, but she does it, and I, and I do it that, that way um, in there. You know, at work, I've tried to embrace this spiritual discipline of um, secret acts of service, that at least once a week, I try and find something that I can do to serve somebody else, um, something that's not part of my job, but I do it in secret so that people don't know um, that I've done it. And the reason I do that is because it helps me to stay humble and it helps me to stay in a posture of, of being willing to serve other people. And it, I mean, it could be anything like emptying the dishwasher or tidying something up or putting something away or, or whatever it is. As I work on and see, oh, somebody should do that. That's a bell to me, say, okay, well, maybe you should go in and do that. And then I try not to tell people that, that I've done it. And I often fail because I'm a bloke and I like credit for the things that I do. Um, but what about you? Where can you actively, practically, and sacrificially serve people this week? Now, that's difficult. But this next thing is really challenging. Who's your Judas? Jesus got down at the feet of Judas and washed his feet, knowing what he knew about Judas. Who is your Judas? Who is the person who has hurt you, who's betrayed you, who's upset you, who's offended you, who's made your life more difficult? What does it look like for you to get down at their feet and wash them? We're going to get the band back up stage just as we wrap up this time, but just think about that. You know, is there somebody who comes to mind uh, for you who's done this? Whether they did it intentionally or unintentionally. Who's who's hurt you? Who are you holding um, a grudge uh, against? And then what does it look like for you to serve that person? That is so difficult. Because my temptation or my natural response when somebody does something against me is to repay them. Is to get even uh, with them. You know, that's, that's what I want to do. So maybe I'll, I'll try, if I'm really at my best, well, I won't get even, I'll just try and forget it. But I'm not going to actively go out of my way to serve them. You know, this is what Jesus did. He set this example um, for us. And if you really want to take this up a notch, who is your Judas and what does it look like for you to serve them um, this, this week? I struggle to do this, but I see the value in doing this because when we do this, it diffuses the situation, it takes the power out of the situation, and it actually helps me to let go of the bitterness that I can hold um, in that situation. It helps me to see people as God sees them, not as I see them, and see the love and the value that God has for them. Do you know that? God loves and values that person who's hurt you. And, you know, and I know, you know, I'm not in your situation, I don't know who it is, and I don't know what they've done, and if they did it to me, yeah, I, I mean, I wouldn't serve them as well. You know, I would want to pull rocks over their head or, or something like that. Of course, of course I would. But Jesus has set an example for us, and if we're willing to follow him into that, I think he's willing to meet us in that and do something amazing in us, that we will be blessed if we do these things. So, Where can you practically, actively, and sacrificially serve people this week? And who is your Judas? Grab a towel and get washing. Why don't we stand to our feet and let's pray together. Father God, I thank you so much for what you have done for us, for how you have demonstrated uh, this to us. And Lord, I'm challenged um, by it. This is difficult stuff um, to do. I thank you that you've not called me, you've not called us to do this in our own strength. Because in my own strength, I am selfish and I want to do the things that I want to do. But I don't want to rely on my strength. I want to rely on your strength. So I pray that by the spirit that you've placed within us, for those of us who follow you and have dedicated our lives to you, you would help us to be like you you, to follow your example, to serve one another, and to be blessed as we do that. Thank you, Lord. Amen.